Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me in the locker room on this Thursday, February 24th. I'm Alan Locker. Emmy Award winning actress Kathleen Noon is here today to look back at her incredible career on stage and screen. She made her television debut on As the World Turns as Margaret Porter in 1975. In 1977, she moved over to Pine Valley playing Ellen Shepard Dalton for the next 11 and a half years on All My Children. And she earned a Daytime Emmy Award for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Drama Series. In 1996, Aaron Spelling requested that she play the part of Bet on Sunset Beach, earning her third Emmy nomination. And then she joined the cast of Passions as Edna Wallace, earning her fourth Emmy nomination. Shortly after her arrival in Hollywood, Kathleen landed a number of guest starring roles on such shows as Quantum Leap, Hunter, and Empty Nest before accepting the leading role of Claudia Whitaker on the primetime hit series, Knots Landing. Um, after Knots, she moved to recurring roles on L.A. Law and Party of Five. And soon after, she tackled co comedic roles on Frasier, Love and War, Ned and Stacy, Murphy Brown, and Ellen. Some of her other film and guest starring television appearances include uh, You Don't Mess with the Zohan, About 50, United States of Tower, and a recurring role on the hit Showtime series, Dexter. She also starred on stage with Linda Gray in Bette Davis Speaks. We have so much to get into this afternoon. Please welcome to the locker room, Emmy award-winning actress, Kathleen Noon. Hey, Kathleen. Hi, hello everyone. Thank, Thank you for tuning in. And I got to do something right off the boat. I love the name of your show, Locker Room. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Thank you very much. My, I wish my parents could see it for that purpose. So, <laughs> um, you know, I, I must tell you, I did a Sunset Beach reunion last week with mm -hmm. a lot of the cast members, and oh, they yeah. all had such lovely, lovely things to say about you. Oh, how, how nice, and how nice to hear that. I really liked that they were a very good group. Uh, all the shows, the Sunset Beach and Passions and All My Children, I always had the privilege of working with wonderful people. Well, the, the, a lot of the um, co-stars on Sunset Beach said they, they just loved watching, watching you in action. And <laughs> when, when I was promoting this, Michael Corbett told me to say hello to you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, that's so wonderful. I hope and he's doing yeah, he's 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 a busy he's a busy guy. But I, I also want to say before we get started, thank you to Jonathan Reiner for introducing us. Yes, I yes. Jonathan, yay, Jonathan. <laughs> exactly, I appreciate that very much. I was excited to read that you're a Jersey girl like me. You grew I, up in New Jersey. <laughs> I was born in uh, Long Island, and then I my friend, dad moved us over. We lived in the city, New York City, for a while, and then my dad moved us over to Hillsdale, New Jersey, in Bergen County. Yeah, I grew up in Bergen County. Hillsdale was near um, uh, Montvale, uh, Westwood, Montvale. Yeah, I was that area. correct. I was born in Westwood. I was born in Westwood, New Jersey. Oh, huh. Westwood guy. There used to be a great. Um, like soda fountain place in Westwood that I used to love to go to because I love coffee ice cream and they were the introduction for me to that. And he would have coffee ice cream, coffee syrup and whipped cream. I was the happiest girl in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I would be, yeah. I would I be too. I, I'm sweet. My entire life. I'm a, I'm a sweet. I love my sweets. <laughs> love my sweets. Are you back east now? I am. I'm. In, you know, I lived in New York for 50. I've worked in New York for like 35, 40 years and um, moved back to Jersey about five years ago, which I never thought I would. Yeah. Love it. So and and, you know, knowing the pa not knowing the pandemic was coming, it was the best decision we made, you know, just having a house and not being in an apartment during that time. Yes. Well, thank goodness you're safe and healthy. That's great. Well, one hundred percent. So um, you grew up with three sisters. And, and do I have it right that your dad wanted each of you to learn a musical instrument when you were younger? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was very important to him. Well, and what happened is my second sister, Sandy, uh, became a prodigy in music. Um, wow. a concert saxophonist. Uh, what happened is that on Sundays they used to have um, the, um, the Jimmy Dorsey. 
show on Sundays, along with Milton Berle and other nighttime sh uh, Sunday night sh shows. And Sandy started a correspondence with uh, Jimmy Dorsey. And so he invited her to come to New York to be in the show. And after the show was over, she would then be invited to go up on stage and play with the band. And um, so it was wonderful. And what instrument did I take? Because I was not going to follow my sisters and take piano. No, thank you. Dumb me that time. I took the trombone. <laughs> wow. And I could never reach the sixth position. My arm wasn't full enough. So those <laughs> were always missing. They would always stick me in front of the uh, drummer. And that was too noisy. So <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> Julie stopped that. And I thought the little spit valve was cute. Um, but <laughs> what I realized is no, I have to. I, so I went into singing. I formed an octet. And we used to sing for all the, you know, the auditorium shows, that kind of thing. <laughs> so and you said that. I mean, yeah. Hmm. But you say that singing opened up to you becoming the creative artist that you are. Tell us how. Well, you know, I was so young. My goodness, I was in high school. And the music teacher, when I was in high school, um, really took me under his belt. His name was Fred Mayer. And he would say to me, kid, you've got some talent. And I, you know, me, I, you know, I was shy. I didn't know my name. I still don't know my name sometimes. <laughs> but um, he really took me under his wing. And so I got cast in a couple of musicals that we did in school. And he brought in a wonderful director named Carl Jenis, who was uh, a father of one of the students in school. But he directed the Playhouse 90 and um, many shows in New York City. So he would come out at the end of the day and come and work with us kids. So I had a wonderful teacher who gave me foundation and to trust my instincts. And that's, you know, I keep thinking the actor always has to develop his, his, his or her instincts. And you know something? I find that in life too. You've got to have your instincts to help guide you and show you. And that centered place within you to say, like you did, try this. I got to do something. What am I going to do? Boom, it comes to you. Boom, you've created something wonderful and new and sharing information. So it helped me creatively to open up my mind to know I could do something different from my sisters and be creative in my own right. In other words, I had to find my place in my friend highly powered family <laughs> and that uh, my sisters were high achievers and uh, my two older sisters i told you about the one who I was uh, considered a real prodigy in music and my oldest sister um was a fulbright scholar and so i thought i gotta find my way to fit in this group <laughs> you know so i did mm -hmm. <laughs> um it's what you said about your teacher and you remembered your teacher's name, the impact that a teacher can have on us. Oh, that's been my whole life. That has been my whole life. And I think what it did, it really encouraged and stimulated me to always be on the learning line. In other words, when things are as you well know, at times you go through these cycles in your business and in your life, and they're really rough sometimes. And what's always pulled me through is when I stepped into a place of learning. I mean, I went back, I was, um, I was working on Sunset Beach, I think it was. Yeah. When oh. I went back to get another master's degree in spiritual psychology. And I went to Gary, our producer, and I said, Gary, I want to take this class because they were teaching it on weekends, um, one weekend a month, Friday night, Saturday and Sunday. And I did that for two years. And I asked him if he wouldn't mind letting me shoot my last scene so I could get down to a, a five o'clock start time for my class on Friday night. And he was willing to work with me. And I was so appreciative of that. And it enabled me to get another master's degree later on in life um, in spiritual psychology, which I loved. And it's had a major impact in my life. 
That's awesome. I, and I, we will talk about that later on. You, you graduated from Southern Mest Methodist University or SMU yeah. with the honor of most outstanding graduate actress and a master of fine arts degree. What yeah. was, cause I know that it is a, a very large, you know, uh, impactful acting school. What was your experience like at SMU? Oh, it was wonderful. I, See, prior to that, I had always been doing more musical comedy, but I still felt as though I didn't understand the craft or the art of acting. And I knew when I finished undergraduate school, I said, no, I need more training. And I didn't want to go to New York and get Is there a particular uh, reason. Yes, I didn't want to go back to New York and because I didn't want to get a day job, then have to try and take classes at night. It was too split focused for me. For me, I thought you would find a place where you can dive in. And this is an interesting story about going back to trusting instant instincts that we were talking about. I uh, applied to SMU. I went down there. I had $50 to my name. I had no money to go to school, but I thought I'm going. I was accepted. I'm going. <laughs> so. <laughs> I had a couple of friends who had been in school there. So I stayed over with them, went over to the department head uh, when I arrived. And he, he, I am Hobgood. And he was just like his name. And uh, he said, well, welcome. You're, we're happy to have you. You can start your classes. And I said, well, there is one problem. I said, I don't have any money to go to school. And he said, oh, well, <clears throat> Well, yeah, then you just have to go get a job. And then when you have some money saved, then you can start classes. And I left the room disgruntled, but I thought, no. My instinct has sent me down here to do this. Something is going to work out. Well, I went to back to my friend's place, slept the night, woke up the next morning. And I said, okay, what instinct, God, source, whatever you want to call it. What am I supposed to do today? And it said, get back over to the department. I walked myself over to that department and I stood in the middle of the floor because they had all these desks for the teachers because they were in the process of building this new theater wing. And I just stood there and I thought, I'm just going to stay here until I get the answer. I am Hoggard, walks out of his back office, head of the department. And he says, oh, you, come here, Cap, go over. I have to talk to you. I said, okay. He said, one of our graduate students decided not to return. So we're giving you his full scholarship and a monthly stipend. Wow, he's right. I thought, okay. I followed my instinct, followed my guidance, showed up, and by God, look at it. And so I got one of the most wonderful educations I could have gotten was a great teacher. His name was Jack Clay. He's passed on now and really worked us as a whole class. Um, wonderful people came out of our class. Kathy Bates, uh, Garland Wright, who was a director writer, um, uh, Jack Hefner, I mean, a number of wonderful people who were always doing a lot of work in the industry. And uh, it gave me that foundation that I wanted. I had known how to do a musical. Now I needed to know how do I put this together and try and be a good actress, a well-trained, highly skilled actress. So from there, I then I started to work in different repertory companies around the country. And that gave me all my background in all the classics, Shakespeare, Sheridan, Shaw, and modern plays, Joe Egg, that kind of thing. And I performed with different repertory companies um, for a number of years before I decided to go back to New York and see how I could make my way there. Um, Do you have it, a favorite role in those repertory companies? Do you have yes. a favorite? Yes, I loved doing, uh, I did two different performances um, one I played Olivia in Twelfth Night and the other one I played Viola in Twelfth Night. And that was an interesting experience for me because going back and doing Shakespeare from two different perspectives of characters gave me that experience of broadening 
as I examine and study scripts and study characters. I had a wire frame to work from, you know? So that I loved, I just loved. And I also loved, we were doing a show at the Oslo Theater in Sarasota, Florida. The Oslo Theater was brought over by Ringling Brothers from Oslo, Italy. And he's put it right on his grounds there at the Oslo Theater by the Ringling Museum in, in Sarasota, Florida. And we were doing a show called Love for Love. And I'm an easy laugher, right? <laughs> and I'm on the stage and the fellow comes on the stage, fellow actor comes on the stage and he has to set up this little table. Well, he sets up the table, sits down immediately, the whole thing collapses. And I'm looking at him and we're trying to control ourselves, but I hear all the actors in this final moment laughing behind me. And one of the girls has one of those outfits where her little shoulders and her little ruffles are just shaking like this. I catch it out of the corner of my eye and I'm gone. I am gone. And the wonderful thing is about the audience. This is what I love about audiences. They really went along with it and they started laughing with us. And that's the wonderful thing about theater. You know, you had moments that are insane and boom, you're in the middle of it. And it, they go along with you if they're working with you, you know? And that's, that's the thing I love about theater. It's so instant, instant. You never know what's going to happen from night to night. The, the reaction is boom. <laughs> boom, right there. And you also know when you walk on a stage, whether the audience is really there that night with you or not. And when I it's... Bet. And there are not, there's like a whole vibe around an audience. And you say, man, I am not their cup of tea tonight. You know? <laughs> and I go back, and do my, you know, my wampum dance and my dressing room dance, <laughs> and praying to God I can come on in the right way and that we'll finally connect. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Interesting. And, yeah. And your memory is fantastic. Um, you landed in the role of Margaret Porter on As the World Turns. What what do you remember? Was that your first on-camera role? I think it was. I think it was. Frankly, I was so surprised when you mentioned it because I had forgotten about it. And <laughs> it, it gave me the chance because I knew um, there was a wonderful woman named Mary Norton. And back then at CBS on 57th Street, New York City, they used to have an open call for casting. And Mary Norton, once a month, would bring in new people that she had never met or, or known and, and gave us a chance to do, you know, a two or three minute audition so she could see us and who we were, et cetera, et cetera. And she gave me the break of going in and getting started with, you know, under five roles, you know, day pair kind of thing. So I could get used to it and it helped teach me about what the cameras were. Cause I had no training with that prior to that, you know? So I don't remember the role much, but I sure mm -hmm. do remember the experience of thinking, oh my God, I have a whole new skill set to learn, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and how did the role of Ellen come about on All My Children? Again, I auditioned for it. Oh, I remember that day. Um, we had to do that on 6th Avenue. So I went over to the offices that they were in. Uh, in Sixth ABC, Avenue. that's right. ABC used to be at like 1335. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah. And so I went in praying to God I would get the job because I needed it so, you know, like everybody. And I auditioned and uh, I got the call. I was so excited. Oh God, I was so excited. I was gonna be on all my children, you know. Um, uh, and, and to start that end of a career, see, because I had always been used to working, you know, um, eight shows a week, seven days, um, Monday off, we work at night. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna have a life. You work. You, and you put in long hours, but it's daytime hours. And you have, on the whole, you have the nights and weekends free. Sometimes when we were doing special events or special shootings uh, for all my children, 
we would sometimes have to do a Saturday shoot or a Saturday promo thing. But I thought, oh my God, it's wow. <laughs> Aren't I lucky, <laughs> you know, as an actor to have a job where I can know what daylight hours are. <laughs> <laughs> when you said yes to the role of Ellen, could you have ever imagined it would last 11 and a half years? Oh my God, no. But I was hoping because I loved working on all my children. I loved it. Sure, it was always hard for the ego when we became the back burner story, but mm -hmm. you realized with big casts, you share, share the wealth. And I also, coming from the theater and working in that medium, I thought, what a natural progression it was to work on All My Children and the daytime soaps because... What it teaches you, you cannot lie in front of that camera. When I'm on the stage and I'm not feeling it, I can try and walk my way through it at times. Boy, that camera is so up your nose that <laughs> the second you are not truthful, it, it shows it. And you can see it. And I would go back and watch the shows when they would air because I needed to learn. And I would think, oh, my God, were you Miss Foley below me then? And I made <laughs> You can't do that. You have to be in each no. one. And you have to work quickly. And what helped me with that was my theater background. Because you have to have skills and skill sets to do all that. So I loved it. And I always loved working in daytime. I always did. I mean, when I moved out here, I thought I, in California, I thought I'd landed on Mars at first. Because it was such a different approach and work ethic. And the only way I made it work is that I thought you have to come out here thinking you're starting all over in your career. And that's what I did. I was a woman I was working with uh, who had helped me a lot. Um, and as far as getting indoors and meeting people and just trying to set up that kind of thing and that helped lay the groundwork. And I was willing to do the groundwork and get in there and keep my mind set. You're starting all over again. Only this time you're coming out with an Emmy in your hand with some <laughs> credentials behind you. And, For sure. and so also daytime was extraordinarily popular at that time. So, so many people watched it, you know, that you- They, they, they you certainly know, did. Casting people knew who you were more. You know, interesting, interesting. Yeah. Well, before before we get to Hollywood, um, Dee was asking, can you share memories of working opposite Mark Lemura and of course oh, Susan Mooch? Susan, I may get a little emotional. Don't mind it, please. Um, but his loss is tremendous to me. Um, I said, sure, his family, but no, Mark and I had a wonderful, wonderful working relation. He was crazier than a bed bug. And I love that about him. He was also <laughs> and fun. I mean, I remember we were doing a scene once we were in Ellen's shop. She owned a dress shop. And I was, you know, commiserating about something, so worried about something. And I had, yeah, I was facing camera and he was behind me. So what he did, he took a hand off of the mannequin and came around and put his hand around here <laughs> to be like, comfort me. So I had this wooden mannequin's hand around front. <laughs> 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 spontaneous and fun like that, you know? And we used to do crazy things. We used to, short, to Dick Schoberg, we would always short sheet the bed that he and Susan had to do a scene in before they could get in. And then we put cornflakes in it. <laughs> We were very bad. And just to start it off, so I mean, we do this during rehearsal so they could change it all around. So when it was time to go, you, you went. But uh, we had some moments like that, that we would do. We would always try and break Peter White up, who played a character named Link. And Mark and I would sit behind the camera with a sign of some, some obscene thing, you know, just right there for him to look at. <laughs> Well, so we would do this. It was a good spirited group, you know, and Mark was 
he was wonderful to work with. He was one was a good actor, really good actor. And he wasn't afraid. Those scenes that we did for his drug rehab, which I was very honored to receive the Emmy Award for, those scenes were so effective. And I got a, a an e not an email, not at that time, um, but no, mail. <laughs> or, or a letter from somebody yeah. who was saying that they were struggling with uh, drug addiction and that had, they were on a, a path where they had were been in rehab and, and they saw our show because they were at a breaking point again and they were ready to walk out the door and get some drugs on the street. And they happened to turn on all my children hmm. and saw the scene that was what I was doing with Mark in the rehab center and absolutely stopped and put themselves back into rehab. So, I mean, the effect wow. you could have with daytime. And of course, I was playing a character who uh, Agnes was wonderful enough to give me those kind of storylines where you really affected people's lives at times, beyond which, you know, you know, so I always felt a great responsibility um, in the work because I felt it a privilege. Mm. And, and it's such a machine to keep moving forward. But we had a good group on that show when I was there. We'd get together, we'd go bowling together, we'd get the crew together. You know, it was that kind of an atmosphere. and We loved it. Did anyone take you under their wing when you got there? Uh, no. No, no, I uh, just really just came on, said hello to people, and because Mark did your work. About Mark had just started, I think, about a couple of months before I did, oh, and okay. then I came in, and then they were going to interweave all these you know, our storylines uh, together because it was the first time they were dealing with an older woman and a younger man theme in relationship. Um, so they, Agnes they were, certainly knew how to tackle story. Uh, wasn't she terrific in that regard and ahead of her time? Mm -hmm. That's so ahead of her time. I really felt that was one of the most wonderful places that I had worked, you know, with good people. We were all developing and trying to make it work. And, you know, Susu and I would have a good time together too. Susan Lucci, I always called her. Is that what you called her? Yeah, Susu. <laughs> and she called Susu. me Susu. <laughs> Susu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, you were talking, you know, 11 and a half years and then you go out to Hollywood. So leaving behind the successful part, um, mm -hmm. winning the Emmy. And then what was it like finding success on Knott's Landing? Well, it was amazing. I remember I they had been auditioning people for well over a month. And I just switched agents out in Hollywood. And um, the, as I was switching, what happened, again, this is where instinct comes in, like when I told you the story about school and getting the scholarship. Um, I Something told me I needed to switch from the agency that I was with. They were all very big and high powered and all that. And I said, I really don't, I work, I'm more personable. And I'm looking for that. So my manager at the time had set up this meeting uh, because he had sent in my picture and the fellow who became my agent happened to see it as he was walking in the front door one morning. He said, get her in here right away because he knew my work from all my children. So I came in. He is my agent to this day. Wow. I, yes, I've been with him. This is, I'm telling you, how things happen. So he... What he did is he submitted me immediately, knowing they were looking for a character. And so I got in on the tail end of that audition. I remember going down to Sony Studios, walking in that room. I did my audition. As I was leaving the building, they were calling Mark, making the deal. I didn't know this. What I did, because I had an old longtime friend of mine from the East Coast out visiting me. And uh, she came along for a ride to see what I do with her. So she said, she said, as we parked in front of the agent's office, I said, I should go in and just check with them, let them know, because it was the first major audition. I went from them. 
So I, uh, she said, I'm just going to sit here in the car. You're not going to be long. I said, no. And <laughs> went in and that's when Mark and Judy Shane, who ran the agency, said, you just got yourself a job. I was screaming. We were dancing around the office, carrying on like you can't believe. It was so fun. So fun. What wow. You- and, and I mean, for him, him to see your picture, recognize you from all my children, change yes. your life in that moment. You know, and like, welcome. Get, knowing that audition was there, getting me in at last minute, and that boom, 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 other doors opened up. And that opened up my door out here to become a little bit more known than what I was from the East Coast, which was a help at that time. Well, it, All My Children was certainly a big show, but oh, sadly, wow. daytime shows, you know, don't compare to what Knott's Landing or Dynasty, you know, you that's, and Knott's Landing at that time was yeah. a very large hit for CBS, so... Oh God! Um, Ever and it was so fun to play such a witch. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Jane says I loved her on all the shows, but I remember her character on Knots Landing. She had a scene where she was talking about her jealousy that their mom gave Greg William Devane's character all the attention. It was oh, so God. dramatic and made me so sad watching. Oh, um, what was uh, <laughs> Bill Devane like? <laughs> What oh, was Bill, Bill was a character. <laughs> I really liked him and I liked working with him because he's a good actor. And he directed a couple of shows. And that was good to work with, too. And I would, he, he was always so pleased because myself and Michelle would always come in prepared. I mean, really prepared. And he always appreciated that. So when we wound up on the set giving us notes, it was quick, it was easy, and we'd get it done. He was always so appreciative of that. Um, uh, at first, he was hard to get to know. But when he saw that you were doing your work as the actor or whatever, he would do everything he could to support you and to help you. That's uh, awesome, helping, you know, break you into other people and make comments behind you, me not knowing. God, she's got more experience than all of us. What the hell are you talking about? I mean, these are things that I had heard he had said. And so I think, oh, okay. Because at first I thought he didn't like working with me because he's private. He's that private. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I just, okay, just keep doing what I'm doing. And then hopefully it'll open up. <laughs> it did. You know, it did. You had a friend enemy relationship with Michelle Phillips' character on Knott's Land. Yes. What, what was that like? Was that oh, fun? She, Michelle is great. She's terrific and fun to play with and fun to work with. Again, always did her work, came in prepared. And uh, I really like that. I really like that. You know, she's just a, a good egg, and a good egg is a human being. You know, you know, what do you think? I mean, you, you definitely, you know, having done so much stage before you got to all my children, but what do you think you learned at all my children that may have helped you when you got knots? Well, that's a very good question because what all my children taught me was how to work in front of three, three cameras, you know, cause you're in a studio situation. You're working now in front of one camera. So what I had to learn about is, you know, the the and it's there's a tediousness to it for me. That's why I admire anybody who can do film work and do it well. I I think I'm mediocre at that. But because, you know, you had to do a master shot, and at this time it was all one camera. They didn't have second cameras or three cameras. Now they understand that they have a lot more freedom and can send up different scenarios which help you play the scene so that you were not only shooting, we were only like you would shoot a master and then you would go back and relight and then you'd separate and then you'd you know, shoot the two people over here then you shoot the two people over here. Then you do the singles on each one. It's a long, tedious process to me. Where I was used to working 
like that, off the cuff, in you know, doing a scene and really making that scene work. You make the scene work, then your performances are working. You know, and vice versa. More, more so on all my children because you're doing it for the full three cameras where yes. you're just doing bits and pieces on Knott's Landing. Yes, yes. even yeah. though you're doing a master, yeah. yeah. But at the same time, it was more broken down. And that that was always a challenge to me because I, I, I was so used to working in, in the context of a play, a scene, a wholeness. And then the cameras were there to catch all that. And they did. And the cameramen on All My Children were terrific. They had to be on their toes like this, you know, and they were. They were wonderful. In that. I had to follow you all. Oh, God. And even sometimes the changes, if something spontaneous happened, like the hand coming around, you know, <laughs> yeah. directly in the booth saying, catch that, catch that, you know. So they were adjusting frames and all of that. It was, it was really good. It was really good. I bet. Aaron Spelling asked oh, you to, to play the play mm -hmm. his ex on Sunset Beach. Well, what did you think when he reached out? Well, he didn't reach out personally to me. It was um, his uh, team. His team, yes. And um, uh, and Gary, uh, Gary, who is the producer, exec producer on it, really. Uh, put me forward for that. And I guess somehow it, I made the clearances and um, then got the role. And of course I created this character um, in my imagination. Because say mm -hmm. she married a lot. I said, okay, she had eight husbands and she would wear a lot of their rings on her fingers. Um, <laughs> and so uh, Mr. Spelling uh, became one of the husbands. He wanted to come on to one of the husbands. They were looking to help boost the ratings. Gary of Tomlin. Gary, thank you. Tomlin. And uh, he's wonderful. Um, and uh, he, uh, Mr. Sterling, uh, came in with Jonathan Levin, his assistant, uh, his associate, pardon me. And um, he came in and, he, and I said, would you like to run lines, Mr. Spelling? You know, so we would go in my dressing room, we would do that. And wow. he, me, <laughs> and he asked me, you know, about my history, my background. He says, I understand you have a master's degree. I said, yes, I do. And I'm in the process of going for another one. And so Jonathan happened to work. He says, do you realize this woman has a master's degree? And she's getting another one. My guy is wonderful. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm going to her Darren Spelling here, you know. But he came on, we did the show, we did the scenes together, and he was wonderful in it, you know. And I had some fun with him, and, and he was just terrific. He was just a terrific human being, a lovely man. Lovely, I, very I, gentleman. You know, I really, you know, I wow. grew up on, you know, his television programming, everything was, you know, yeah. my childhood. And uh, doing the Sunset Beach reunion with all of the cast members and his son, Randy, participated. Yes, lovely. Uh, oh. Everybody, everybody was talking about what a gentleman and what a what a good guy he really, really, Always. you know, that he was he was on set a lot. He he. Yeah, that yeah. he was a good, you know, yes, when there. you think of a Hollywood producer like that, you you might not expect to hear the nicest of um, qualities. And where he never forgot his humanity. And I think mm -hmm. that he was the key to his greatness. You know, if he's a human being first, you know. So he treated people respectfully, respected what they did with their jobs, you know. That I took that one hundred percent away. And I must tell you, there are a ton of Sunset Beach fans watching today. Sunset Beach had a very large following all over the world. We had people Last week, I think, from Poland and Russia and so many, so many different countries. But uh, Isn't that great? Yeah. Well, hello to all of you. If any of you <laughs> today, hello and welcome. Somebody just asked, Paul just asked if, if Kathleen wishes she had a storyline with Mrs. Moreau on Sunset Beach. I don't know who Mrs. Moreau was. Me either. Mrs. Moreau. Sunset somebody Beach. somebody will tell us so you you went back during sunset beach for uh, a master's degree in spiritual psychology forgive me but what is spiritual 
psychology? Spiritual psychology is based on, you know, the good standard studies of psychology and major, you know, psych, you know, psychi psychiatrists and studies and writers and developers over the years. What it adds to it or expands on it is the importance to get down to your own truth and that instinct part of you that knows. Do you know there's a place called the HeartMath Institute? And the HeartMath Institute has been around for 25 years. And the idea is to study all the heart and what its influences are to our body. Well, they discovered that the heart sends more information to the brain than vice versa. So it truly is a seat of intelligence, a seat of wisdom. And the idea is for each of us individually to find our way to sit in our truth authentically and then live by it. Now, with regular therapy, uh, it, it helps you break down your daily routines, you know, and see what the patterns are and how to change them. If you want to change a pattern for perpetuity, You've got to get down to the heart level. And what spiritual psychology does is help give tools to help the client you're working with to get down to that heart, to get overpower, not overpower, but instead of letting the mind do all the decision-making, invite your heart into the process because your heart, your instinct, that center of truth in you doesn't lie and doesn't steer you wrong. It really pu pushes and moves you in the right direction if you are willing to listen and allow it. I hope that's so helps. impressed, so impressed. I, I mean, love that you went back to school. Well, that's a wonderful school, University of Santa Monica. You love to learn, and you love yes. to learn. Yes, yes, and I, it, it helped my life. It helped my life tremendously. See, because yes. for me, there was blocks that I had within me that I thought when I lose or leave, you know, not slanting, whatever, I don't mm -hmm. want to be the actress who's, you know, throwing yourself around the floor. I want to have more uh, intelligent intention in my life for a positive outcome. So going back and doing those studies helped me. You know, it, it, that is so great for other people to hear because it helps, I think, people. Um, a lot of people get stuck what to do next, you know, yeah. or the, or this career doesn't work out. And that's, yeah. um, you know, um, Mrs. Moreau was the voodoo woman who helped with the turkey baster. I don't ah. know if you remember that. <laughs> Gee, I had, that was so out of my storyline. Yeah. Uh, and, and, no. Uh, turkey, oh. turkey baster on Sunset Beach and then an orangutan on Passions. I loved it. Um, <laughs> sure I had nothing to do with the orangutan. I did. <laughs> that was fun. That was so fun. Loved working with her. Loved it. I, you know, I love that. I'll tell you a story about that if you don't mind. We have time. Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> we were doing this wedding scene, right? So it's a big, you know, room. They have this. Um, portable bar that they had set up. In other words, it was a, uh, just the, the, the back end of it was all wooden and closed in, but on the other side of it were the glasses for the bar, et cetera, et cetera. So they were taking a five minute break. I was there with Bam Bam and um, Precious. And um, we were talking and he's, we were talking. That's what you do with an orangutan. <laughs> you were having a deep conversation. Yes. Well, <laughs> the trainer was like um, a row of seats ahead of, ahead of, in front of us, and he's hiding behind the chair, right? Because he wants to keep the the you know bam bam right there and don't get him too excited or anything because we have work to do. Well, the interesting thing was here's his trainer right here, and he was always into looking at anything. If you had anything on the set, he wanted his hands on it. He wanted to be with it. If you gave him a brush, he'd just break the brush in half, but it became a new toy for him. He was so strong. 
So he's sitting there and um, I'm sitting there with him and just quietly talking with him, you know, and see the trainer over there. And he starts with his arm, this gigantic arm, exploring this bar behind this. And he shakes it. And of course the glasses rattle. Well, it scared the hell out of him. And what did he do? He didn't run to the trainer. He jumped on my lap. And I felt like Sally Field. He likes me. <laughs> 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 oh, that is so, so great. It's so uh, fun, you know. I love that. <laughs> what a, I mean, you know, both Sunset Beach and Passions, unique uh, daytime dramas for sure. In well, the yeah, I'm two of the most fun, outrageous characters I've played. And that I loved. That I loved. Playing Mrs. Wallace was a hoot. It's got to be so fun to play uh, these well, these kind of, you don't have to worry about what you look like. You put it on, <laughs> and, you know, you go into your Mrs. Wallace voice, you know, and <laughs> you're able to play. I mean, it was like really play. I mean, one time I cracked myself up. I had to be <laughs> in the living room and hear the people are walking in the room. And uh, I had to pretend I was hiding. So I went over and stood by the lamp and put the lampshade on my head. So I'm thinking that I was holding now. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that, is, that is so fun. Scene. <laughs> yeah, that is fun. It's a great way to um, go. Yeah, totally. Uh, a Sunset Beach fan, Carol, is asking, um, any memories of working with Peter Barton? Peter Barton? Oh, my goodness, yes. Uh, he played one of that. Eddie. He played Eddie, I think. Eddie Connors. Eddie Connors. Yes, didn't I? I think that's, I worked with him, didn't yeah, I? Yeah, I he believe did. so. They're asking about him, so I apologize if if not. No, no, no. Uh, somebody will tell us, somebody will tell us in a minute. Uh, I'll ask you another question. We'll get, we'll find out who Eddie and Peter played. You know, we were talking about Agnes earlier, Aaron yeah. Spelling. You know, you worked with two legendary writers and producers. How do you think, or in your eyes from, you know, starting on All My Children and then doing Sunset Beach, how has storytelling changed and, and stayed the same over the years? Hmm. Well, everybody loves a good story. And this, what I think we've gotten away from is our stories have become about actions and not about people. Characters, yeah. Yeah, it's characters in relationship. Look at life, what is it about? Relationship. And so when you hear and work on stories that are, what are we all drawn to? We wanna hear all about the stories of these beautiful Olympians that we just saw. What are their backstories? That's what gets us involved. Even the kids that go on to, you know, The Voice or uh, the other one on ABC, it's their 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 stories behind them is what pulls us in because we want to come from the heart. Where what I think I'm concerned about is that we've gotten so involved in the action, and the action sometimes is so doer that we need to find ways to balance it with telling stories that encourage people to move forward. Because that's what we all do in our individual lives. We do, you know, yeah. We sit here and bemoan and berate and stay dark and, oh, this is never gonna work. That's exactly where you're gonna stay. But mm -hmm. if you present something that could be hopeful or a way out or a solution, People want to be a part of that because what is life but evolutionary? You know what I'm saying? So I think mm -hmm. we do not lose that in our writing and in our work. Don't lose heart in your writing. Don't get so swallowed up with the action scenes. And they're wonderful and they're fun. I love to go to them. They're fun. my popcorn movies, that kind of thing. But don't in that not have heart.
Absolutely. It's what draws us in. You know, it's those family family relationships. Um, Peter was, uh, I think he was uh, one of your boyfriends who died. Yeah, but I thought. Yeah. Maybe I don't have the right name. <laughs> Yes, he was. Well, because it, there was also Eddie Cibrian, I think, who worked on the show. Was, but, I was never involved yeah, with him, but I yeah. was Peter. And he was lovely, lovely to work with, came in, was a good worker, good man, good looking guy, you know. Hey, <laughs> always good to do that. <laughs> yeah, you had, a, you had a few of them over the years. Oh, yes, because <laughs> Bet, Bet had her lineup of men, you know. <laughs> it didn't work. Well, like Mark. Her. Yeah, back, back to Mark on All My Children. Yes. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And that, you know, when you get to work with good actors, actors who are, you know, who do their homework, come in as professionals, but come to give with you, you know, so you can exchange and create something that's interesting. You're not just saying lines up there. You're interacting. You're trying to find each other. You're trying to work with each other, you know, and find yeah. a map space to be in and I could certainly have that with Mark he was there and he was open to it and we had we good work together you know Chuck was asking would you ever consider doing another soap oh sure if it's right if it's fun <clears throat> if there's an interesting role to it and also though that I can go in looking like who I am right now you know I'm 77 years of age I'm and looking beautiful uh, Thank you. You're very kind to say that. I'm saying that, though, for this reason. Women have had to fight and come a long way to be accepted for who and what we are as we age. And there's still fights about this. 100%. More, the more women who are coming into producing, more women who are coming into directing, hopefully there's going to create a space where a woman like myself at my age can go on camera without having to have your major cosmetic surgery. I had to do that when I was younger, but I don't want to do that now at this age. I just want to be me, get older gracefully and graciously and play another character. I'll play another, you know, Mrs. Wallace or anything like that. It's not that, about that is life. Yes. That is life. We, to, we all get older. And get, get used to it. <laughs> you know, and so there was a study done in psychology today. I remember years ago when the daytime soaps were hooked on, um, you know, oh, everything has to be youthful, everything has to be, and psychology today had done a study where they said kids don't want to just look at themselves because if they come from a nuclear family, they want to see mom, dad, aunts, uncles, grandpas, grandmas. And women today as grandpas and grandmas are looking very different from the old paradigm. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of them are just different. We're not, you know, we're taking much better care of ourselves. The medicine is, is uh, certainly educated us to take better care of ourselves, be active, be involved. So it's becoming reflective in how we look and who we are. And there's got to be a space for that out there. And also that you don't keep playing women who come on at our ages as befuddled or or witches you just you, you stop that kind right. of stuff right. so much more women today is so much more educated and so much more to offer you know 100 percent. rebecca says you have given me a gift i'll never forget just love you kathleen oh thank you. ashley says look amazing kathleen i need to know your secrets um, but yes, and, and like I said to you backstage, see, this is a conversation that yeah. people can, you know, learn from and, and not, not only learn from, but like just hearing you say that opens somebody else up to understand and, and feel the same way or want to start speaking up about those types of issues or. Yes. You know. What does it come down to though? Everybody. It comes down to honoring yourself. And we've come through a period in this country where uh, the negativity and the mockery of people became common ground. That's not acceptable. Our job to me here is to find that space within each other that we can honor, 
we can celebrate and we can enjoy. Let's bring the joy back. Let's bring the encouragement back. Let's bring the active support back. Not only man to woman, but woman to woman. Find ways to support women's efforts. Now, as we are stepping forward in a way of loving care, you know, that's what we need to do. Bring more of that divine feminine, if you will, into our lives of saying, I'm going to be of loving service today. That's what the divine feminine is about. It's about sharing, sharing, encouraging, loving. What does a woman, her natural instinct do when she has a baby? Take care of that baby, nurture it, love it. And we get up, we bring those qualities to our adult life until we learn from society that we have to boom, 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 help, you know, brace ourselves for the next blow. And we went through a period in six years, you know, of having to brace for the blows. Not acceptable anymore. That kind of thinking is not acceptable anymore. We are not small people. We are not. And I don't mean to make, turn this into a lecture. No, you, you, you are talking, you know, I, I, I come from two parents who were Holocaust survivors. Oh, wow. you get it. You know, I, you know the, the negativity and sadly, you know, what was unleashed today in the world is, is you know, yeah. it's a scary, it's a scary a time. President, excuse me, a former president congratulating him. What a genius. What this? Right. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I, That's, yeah. mental I, I, That's mental illness. Stop. Yes, it's no. it's it's not a good place. It, it's so much easier to just be kind and to say thank yeah. you and to say hello to someone and to hold the door for someone. Um, Penny says, I've always described Kathleen as a person who lights up a room when she walks in. She instantly always changed the energy for the better. She is wonderful and funny and calming. You are a delight. I, uh, yeah. you know, you should have a podcast. <laughs> Show me what you do, Alan. We'll work on that. Exactly. Um, you, you, you know, you in Hollywood, you've done so many primetime series. Before we go, uh, you know, Dexter, United States of Tara, Ellen Murphy, Brown, Frasier, and and fans wanted to hear of your Frasier experience. Empty Nest. Do you have a favorite? Of yeah, one Fra of your the character of Frasier, I adored. What a fun character, and the reason why I even got. On that, do, do we have a minute? Another minute? Yeah, or two? we do. Yeah, yeah. Got in. Like, so when I went into the, when I got the audition material, I remember sitting there thinking, how the hell do I do this? So thank God my music background taught me. I thought it's just rhythm. Hugalo, hugal, agar, you, you. So I thought once I got that and I was able to read the whole script and I just made it second nature. So I walked into that audition and nailed it and I knew it. And they had, you know, I, I don't know where they had offers, but they were also seeing some major stars for this. But I wound up getting it, and I was so grateful for that because it was one of those hookups where you read a script and you're able to find the key to it for you as an actor, and it works. And then you get the job. Yay! <laughs> That's the best. Uh, you see, from just listening to you, do you like the audition process? I have mixed feelings about it. I'm still in the process of learning the new one where we're all on tape now. Everybody's on tape. And I always liked kind of walking into a room. It was nerve wracking, believe me. Your nerves get you when you walk into this room. <laughs> yeah. And all these producers are standing there, uh, are sitting there. And But it was like live theater to me. So I was familiar really with that. So I thought, I always be nervous sometimes before we walk on the stage. So it's okay because you want, you're anticipating, anticip anticipating a performance that you want to go well. Well, it's the same thing, except there's so much writing on it in an audition for an actor. Because an actor sometimes just is, there were times in my life I was desperate for a job, needed a job. But um, the, ta the tape process today is just different and I have to get used to it. And there isn't that feedback, that kind of work that you get. And also, I love directors. I always want to hear from a director. And sometimes what you find is that everybody else is putting in their two cents. And I just want that director who's got the clear vision, who knows where he wants his camera, 
knows what he wants to do, come talk to me. We'll work this together. You know, that's, I always look at work as a collaboration. It's not, oh, well, look at me, or you're the star, or I'm not, or whatever. It's what can we create together? Has that's there been a favorite that's... director for you? Mm. Oh, God, Michael Lesak. Uh, he's here in this country anymore. He's over in France now. But he was a wonderful actor's director. He really knew how, because he also started a theater in New York City that I, and I, that's how I first got to know him. So he really came from that background. There were a number of them. And forgive me, I just don't know what happened to keep his name. And where, where was he that you worked? Uh, it, it was back in New York. Back in New York. Okay. He's out here, and I did some sitcoms with him. Uh, real actors, director, really knew how to do it, knew how to come up and give you a note and let you do it, and then you just fly with it, and it would be great. Um, there are a number of other directors that I felt were really excellent on daytime. Uh, Fido Xavier on daytime is just terrific. I think oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, he's on General Hospital. He's on General Hospital now. Yeah, and, he, uh, he started on Guiding Light. I know, I know yes. him from yeah, years ago. Wonderfully talented person. Wonderfully talented. And um, uh, there were just a number of people, forgive me uh, for not remembering. Oh, that's a, yeah, absolutely. I just, you yeah. know, since you mentioned it, Kathleen, it is such a delight to speak to you. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Jonathan Reiner. Yes, yay, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> you stay well. I will. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Bless you, Cindy. Hey. All sorts of good thoughts. Back at you. Have thank a great. Have a great afternoon. Oh, you too, love. Thank you so much for asking me to do this. You're so welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much to Kathleen Noon for joining us today. Join me tomorrow when Anthony Sully Sullivan, who you all may recognize from the OxyClean commercials, he will be here to tell us about his second act as the owner of a hemp farm born out of his want and need to find alternative drugs for his young daughter. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And I will see you tomorrow, everybody. Have a great afternoon and please stay safe.